Grace and peace of our Lord and Savior be with everybody. It's good to see you this afternoon. We are continuing our journey through the Gospel of Luke over these next couple of weeks so that we can kind of stay engaged as a Christian community, even though some of our worship opportunities and small group meetings uh, uh, have been uh, canceled or postponed because of the coronavirus uh, outbreak. I know I said that we would do this about 5 o'clock, but it is sunshiny out here. Uh, looking across the cornfield in Camden County. And so my goal is to get out and do a run uh, before I have a meeting later on at six. So I'm gonna go ahead and do the Bible study now uh, so that those that can access it can access it now live. But as always, it's gonna be posted on my per personal Facebook page. And also uh, I'm setting up a YouTube channel. That way they'll have all of the studies in one convenient, hopefully convenient place uh, those links are on either Camden Methodist Churches, Sheridan United Methodist Churches, Trinity United Methodist Churches uh, uh, webpage. I'll post it to my own personal page later on. This way you can just go straight to YouTube, find all the, the, the lessons there. You can catch up if you need to catch up. You can watch them all at one time if you want to watch them all at one time, uh, whatever it is that, that you want to do. Uh, but for right now, we're going to focus in on uh, Luke uh, chapter 4. Again, we're doing two a day. We're reading scripture. And then I'm going through a devotion book that I have from a J.C. Ryle, his daily readers, uh, that uh, includes uh, gospel lessons in the morning and the afternoon. But again, two chapters a day over two weeks. We'll take care of all 24 chapters of the Gospel of Luke. If you've missed uh, chapters 1, 2, or 3, again, they're either on my page or on the YouTube site. And access to all of that will be made available to you, um, if not now, then, then certainly very, very shortly. Morning sessions will be about 10, evening sessions around 7 or so, but again, we're getting a jump start on things tonight uh, for uh, chapter 4. Before we get, dig in, though, let me uh, gather us all together and have a word of prayer. Gracious and Holy One, we give thanks to you for this day that you have given us and seeing us to this space at this time. We ask that you be present with us as we read through the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Luke have our discussion, help this to be a holy and reverent time for everybody, and help us all to emerge from this, this brief lesson encouraged and strengthened by your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so fourth chapter in the Gospel of Luke. And again, like we've been talking about, even if you have your Bible there beside you, you have your Bible app on your phone, set that aside. And instead of reading, trying to keep along or keep the same pace that I'm reading, just let the words wash over you. Just listen to, to what I'm saying. If you want to adopt a posture of prayer and close your eyes, that's fine. But listen to the words of the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. See what might jump out at you. See what things might uh, cause some uh, stirring in your heart, your soul, so to speak. And again, take advantage of the, uh, the Facebook message uh, opportunities to send me a question, a comment, um, whatever is on your mind. I'll be more than happy to, to look at them and answer them. Uh, as I can. But now this is the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. This is right after Jesus has been baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist. It says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. And the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I will give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will be all yours. Jesus answered him, it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. 
he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, meaning there was a drought, and there was a severe famine all over the land. Yet Elijah went to none of them, except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed ex except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. He went down to Capernaum, a city in Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath. They were astounded at his teaching, because he spoke with authority. In the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Let us alone. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. When the demon had thrown him down before them, he came out of him without having done him any harm. They were all amazed and kept saying to one another, what kind of utterance is this? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and out they come. And a report about him began to reach every place in the region. After leaving the synagogue, he entered Simon's house. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked him about her. Then he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. Immediately she got up and began to serve them. As the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various kinds of diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on each of them and cured them. Demons also came out of many, shouting, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them, and would not allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Messiah. At daybreak he departed and went into a deserted place, and the crowds were looking for him, and when they reached him, they wanted to prevent him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. So he continued proclaiming the message in the synagogues of Judea. So this is a, an interesting chapter. It, it may be one of my favorite chapters in the gospel because it gives us a whole lot to chew on. And... We don't have enough time to, quote, chew on everything. But I want to point out a few things just from reading, some of which I've mentioned before during our worship services and some which kind of come to mind as I read it. The bit here with Jesus being tempted in the wilderness by the devil um, is interesting because he was just baptized. And you heard, here's this voice say, this is my son, with my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. And you think, well, this is great. Well, then what happens? Well, he goes out in the wilderness to be tempted. But what, what, what I want to point out is that we need to notice when he was tempted. He was tempted after 40 days of not eating or drinking, which means what? He was weak, right? He was needing something. And friends, that's how temptation works for all of us. We've talked in our worship services a number of times that ultimately the devil, our enemy, is a coward. And he won't come after us when we're at our strongest. Instead, the enemy likes to wait to when we are our weakest, and we are at our weakest, you better believe that's when temptations are going to appear to us to be the strongest. And that typically is when we're going to fall into temptation and then we're going to cause ourselves to sin. 
temptation to sin doesn't go away for any of us. I mean, you could have gone to church every Sunday of your life, Wednesday night worship every Wednesday of your life, and grown up in the church. Temptation is still going to be there. It's still going to be a part of our lives. As soon as we wake up in the morning till the time we go to bed at night, temptation is going to be there. The trick for us is to understand where it is we can find the strength and resources to withstand temptation. Well, it's just like with what Jesus did, with the Holy Word of God. That's how you withstand temptation, by staying in the Word every day and by being in constant prayer with your Heavenly Father, by gathering in small groups and going to church when we're allowed to after the virus is over. They, these are the ways that we combat uh, the devil. One thing I also want to point out is when Jesus goes into the temple in his hometown and he preaches a bit, understand that at first they were amazed and they were very proud of their hometown boy that has come to make good. They were astonished at the authority of his teaching. And then he says, though, uh, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. And that's when they become angry. But think about what Jesus is saying here. All during the Old Testament scriptures when you read those typically when a prophet shows up in your hometown it's not good news uh think about whenever uh there's a natural disaster and jim cantori from the weather channel shows up in your town you don't want that right because he's bringing bad news same thing here the prophets that showed up in these towns during the old testament days were bringing bad news because those people had sinned against god and there was going to be some kind of judgment coming against them so what jesus is saying here is look nobody wants a prophet to come to their hometown because why they don't want to deal with their own sin. They don't want to deal with the ways that they have um, made God angry. Part two of that is also that they're angry at him because the stories he tells about Elijah and Elisha, the miracles that were worked were worked for families that were Gentiles, right? So Jesus' people are all Jews. So they expect all the miracles and the Messiah to come and save them because they are the chosen people of God. But what Jesus is doing here is he's opening that door for the Gentiles also to be part of God's salvation story. So this is what's kind of making them a little bit uh, a little bit upset. Um, so again, there's a lot we can unpack in these in this particular chapter. But I want to turn now to the devotion readings uh, for the chapter, um, and they focus in on uh, chapter I'm sorry verses 14 through 30. So. In verses 14 through 22, this is Jesus when he is beginning his ministry. He's in the synagogue and he's uh, teaching and preaching. And it says here, What a striking account our Lord gave the congregation at Nazareth of his own office and ministry. When our Lord reads Isaiah, he told the listening crowd that he himself was the Messiah of whom these words were written, and that in him and his gospel the marvelous figures of the passage were about to be fulfilled. So again, Jesus takes the scroll of Isaiah he reads it, he puts it down, he says, guess what, that's me. They're talking about me in this, in this uh, uh, scripture from, from Isaiah. He says, our Lord desired to impress on his Jewish hearers the true character of the Messiah. He well knew they were looking for a mere temporal king who would deliver them from Roman dominion. He would have them understand that Messiah's kingdom was to be a spiritual kingdom over hearts. His victories were not to be over worldly enemies, but over sin. His redemption was not to be from the power of Rome, but from the power of the devil and the world. Bear in mind the kind of Messiah that most of the Jewish people were expecting. They're expecting someone to come in, riding on a horse, big flaming sword or whatnot, and taking over and, and debilitating the Roman Empire. Very much like a warlike character. Someone like King David, who would come in and, and lay waste to the Roman armies. Instead, what Jesus is ushering in here is a different kind of kingdom and a different kind of Messiah. Um, what's striking, too, is when we get to uh, Palm Sunday, Jesus comes riding in on a donkey. One thing to understand about the symbolism there is that typically horses were creatures that were used during times of war. So a horse was a warlike creature. Donkeys were creatures of peace. So when two warring uh, nations had finally decided to broker a peace between each other, the two sides would come riding in on a donkey. So Jesus coming riding in is a very symbol of the peace uh, that the kingdom of God was meant to, to usher in. It says, Let us take care that we know for ourselves in what light we ought to regard Christ. It is right and good to reverence him as very God, as head over all things, the mighty prophet, the judge of all, the king of kings. But we, we must not rest here if we hope to be saved. We must know Jesus as the friend of the poor in spirit, the physician of the diseased heart, the deliverer of the soul in bondage. Right? So we can proclaim Jesus to be our Lord, to be our Savior, to be our King, 
But if we haven't turned over our hearts and minds over to him, then it's all for naught. It says, how instructive these verses are in showing us how religious teaching is often heard. His hearers were impressed. They could not find any flaw in the exposition of scripture that they had heard. They could not deny the beauty of the well-chosen language to which they had listened. Except a temporary feeling of admiration, their hearts were unmoved and unaffected. There are thousands who listen regularly to preaching, admire it, do not dispute its truth, and who find an intellectual pleasure in hearing a good and powerful sermon, but their religion never goes beyond that point. Their sermon hearing does not prevent them living a life of thoughtlessness, worldliness, and sin. What we're saying here is that we go to church on Sunday and the preacher preaches a wonderful sermon and we like it because it speaks to us. But then if we leave out of that sanctuary and don't do a single thing during the course of the week to live into that message, then what's really the point, right? You've seen a lot of memes floating around, I think, these last uh, few days about how just because a building is closed doesn't mean the church is closed, right? Church goes on outside the walls of our sanctuary each and every week. So we can come in and have the most wonderful, most eloquent, most uh, terrific preacher that there is. And if all we do is sit and hear with our ears and don't take it in with our hearts, and then in turn take what our hearts uh, absorbs and use our hands and feet to get out there and serve those in our community, then truthfully the sermon didn't do any good. So what sort of hearer are you? What change to your life did the last ser sermon that you heard make? And hopefully you go to a church where you have a, a pretty good preacher. But if you say that, well, I've never been moved by um, my preacher's preaching, then turn to Scripture because there's plenty of sermons in Scripture. Turn to your Sunday school teacher because there are sermons preached every day in, in, in there. Uh, don't limit yourself to just what a man or a woman in the pulpit is telling you on Sunday. Get sources from all over the place to, to get God's Word into you and then in turn take that Word and get out there and do something to help in your community. Particularly these next few weeks or so, as people are starting to become more and more quarantined, more and more isolated from each other, that's gonna be a time for us to really try to reach out as the hands and feet of Christ, to make sure that nobody's forgotten. Make sure you check in on the, the elderly in your particular communities. Make sure you check out on the single people in your communities, no matter what age. If people need errands to be run, maybe volunteer to run errands for them, right? Do whatever it is that you can do to help serve your fellow man out in your community. Then I want to read a little bit um, that talks about uh, verses 22 through 30. Again, this is Luke chapter 4, 22 to 30. And it says, How apt men are to despise the highest privileges when they are familiar with them. The men of Nazareth could find no fault in our Lord's sermon. They could point to no inconsistency in his past life. But because the preacher had lived with them for 30 years, and his face, appearance, and voice were familiar to them, they would not receive his doctrine, just as our Lord expected. We shall do well to remember this lesson in the matter of ordinances and means of grace. We are always in danger of undervaluing them when we have them in abundance. We are apt to think lightly of the privilege of an open Bible, a preached gospel, and the liberty of meeting together for public worship. We grow up in the midst of these things and are apt to have them without trouble. The consequence is that we often hold them very cheap. We soon lose reverence for the name of Christ, the Bible, and other sacred things. I think what he's trying to get out here is that um, Christianity, for lack of a better word, is easy in our country, right? Because we know churches are going to be open. We know we're not going to be persecuted for our faith. We know we can take our Bibles out to the coffee shop and read them. But maybe because of that, we start to take it for granted, right? And it starts to lose maybe some of its reverence for us. I think one silver lining that might come about of having churches be closed for two or three weeks is I hope that it generates in a lot of us a hunger to get to church. You know, when something is taken away from you, then you start to really appreciate the fact that you had it in the first place. So it is certainly possible, like we talked about yesterday, and I think it was chapter two, that when things look dark or things appear to be dying, that's usually when resurrection happens, right? If we are a resurrection people, that doesn't mean just bodily resurrection. It means resurrection of our institutions, resurrections of our faiths. And so maybe this two or three week hiatus is God speaking to us to say, listen, this can be taken away from you very quickly. Take advantage of the fact you have churches that are open and small groups that are available and Bible studies that are available, uh, prayer times that are available for you. And just take a hold of that and cherish that and go out and make disciples of all nations. 
It says, how bitterly human nature dislikes the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. Our Lord reminded the men of Nazareth that God was under no obligation to work miracles among them. He could bypass Israel and work elsewhere. Such doctrine as this was intolerable to the men of Nazareth. It wounded their pride and self-conceit. It taught them that God was no man's debtor and that if they themselves were passed over in the distribution of his mercies, they had no right to find fault. They could not bear it. They thrust the Lord out of the city, and had it not been for an exercise of miraculous power on his part, they would doubtless have put him to a violent death. The sovereignty of God is clearly taught in the Bible. Upon no other principle can we explain why some are converted and some not, some nations enlightened by Christianity and others buried in heathenism. All is ordered by the sovereign hand of God. Let us pray for humility in respect of this deep thing. I think what it boils down to is we don't understand God's plans sometimes. We can certainly know our duties. And our duties are to be humble servants of our Lord. And we've talked before in the last couple of days about this being the season of Lent, about the need for us to really dig in and understand the places we need to have strengthened, those places we need to have straightened. And so I encourage you to continue about your daily prayers, finding a place where you can have holy, if not uncomfortable, silence, uh, to pray to God and see what, what ways God is maybe calling you into service into your community. And I also hope that as, as we go through this Gospel of Luke, you're seeing just how important it is to take advantage of all the opportunities ahead of you in the next few weeks, months, and years to be in corporate worship, to strive for not just personal holiness, but also social holiness, coming together and being the hands and feet of Christ, being part of the body of Christ. Because all of this, friends, ties together not just from the first chapter to the 24th chapter of Luke, but from the Old Testament through the New Testament, through what happened to some odd thousand years ago to what's happening right now. These stories still reverberate. These stories are still the truth. And these are stories that are telling us the ways we need to be living our lives. So that's it for this, this particular session. We'll be back at uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. We'll cover chapter 5 at 10 o'clock. We'll cover chapter 6 uh, sometime tomorrow evening. Again, until then, if you got any questions, concerns, comments, whatever it is, ways we can make this better, um, do let me know by using the, uh, the Facebook message section there at the bottom of this particular post. The links to the uh, YouTube uh, page should be up sometime, uh, hopefully later on this afternoon, so that way you can go back and re-watch uh, the other chapters if you've, if you've missed some of them. Again, for the next two weeks, we're covering the Gospel of Luke, two chapters a day, to try to maintain some sense of I don't want to say normalcy because maybe uh, this isn't normal. Maybe this is the new normal. But in any event, keeping us all together as a Christian community. Let me say a, a closing prayer for all of us. Gracious and Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for this day that you have given us and this opportunity to come together, this time set apart for each and every one of us to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ. We just ask, Lord, that the, the, the proclamation of your word that was just done and the uh, the, the analysis of it and the, the preaching on it, Lord, the discussion about it somehow plants the seed in our hearts to help us to go out and, and to truly appreciate who you are and what you do for us each and every day and help us to take those feelings of joy and gratitude out into our community, showing our sometimes dark world the light of your love. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, my friends, I'll see you 10 o'clock Wednesday morning. God bless.